thank you very much for this kind uh, introduction, Fundy. Hopefully enough, uh, by the end of uh, my presentation, uh, it should may, I should be able to make clear how you move from hydrology to finance when you work on climate change. Can you hear me? Okay. The, um, f the, the, uh, the amount of money involved in uh, financing a uh, transition from a brown economy to a green economy is quite uh, humongous. Depending on the, the estimates you believe, it's anywhere between $1 trillion to $10 trillion a year. I would say it doesn't matter if it's 1 or 10, because when you speak about trillions of uh, dollars, can you hear me? When you speak about trillions of dollars, you speak basically about capital markets. You speak about private sector investment. The, uh, we are speaking about additional investment. And a lot of this investment, for a lot of this green investment, normally should be profitable. A lot of you might be familiar with uh, this uh, greenhouse gas uh, cost abatement curve. It was developed by, by Vattenfall in the 90s and popularized by McKinsey. Basically, what this uh, cost curve shows is that a lot of the green investment can be extremely profitable. There are negative costs. For example, when you invest in energy efficiency or water efficiency, not only you save energy and water, but you also save money. So this graph is quite interesting in terms of uh, sending a very powerful signal to uh, uh, political decision makers. However, it's important to understand how it's, con how it's construct constructed. And uh, this graph is very much based on the cost of money in uh, industrial countries. And that's as a real meaning when it comes to green uh, technologies. One key feature of green technologies is that they often shift operation and maintenance cost against upfront capital cost. And that's the case for energy, that's the case for water, that's the case for climate resilient roads. When you speak about green climate resilient technologies, you often speak about technologies that have higher upfront capital cost and less operation and maintenance cost. And so, for example, if you take wind, the bulk of your money will be upfront. It's $2 million per megawatt. And after, you have only some fairly low operation and maintenance cost. And this, you can compare this with gas, where your uh, upfront cost is much lower, 750, 800, 900,000 dollars per megawatt hour. But after, you have significant uh, fuel cost that could potentially increase quite dramatically depending on the fossil fuel reserves. The, uh, so the cost of money, when you have such high capital costs become extraordinarily important. If uh, you borrow $1 million for your house at a cost of uh, 4 or 5%, you will basically have to reimburse another $1 million in interest rate. But if you borrow it at uh, 40, uh, 14 15%, it's $3 million more that you will have to reimburse in interest rate. And so depending on your cost of uh, financing, the uh, a technology can be profitable or not. When I started my career as an engineer, the main issue with renewable energy were performance, technical performance, and cost of the technology. Today, the key issue with renewable energy is the cost of the financing of the technology. And it's how hydrologists and climatologists suddenly became finance, uh, financiers. Because the issue is very much an issue of having access to long-term affordable finance. The, if we take a wind power project in Europe, right now, wind power is, uh, if you have good windy sites, is basically competitive uh, with uh, gas uh, turbine. It's an extraordinary competitive technology, even if you do not internalize the external cost. In pure direct cost, it is competitive. And the cost of money in Europe is basically 10% for equity, 5% for debts. Now you take the same wind power uh, farm, the same wind farm, the, exactly the same wind technology, exactly the same type of uh, wind resources. 
but this time you transpose it to a developing country where the cost of money is different, where the cost of money is 10% for debts and 18% uh, for equity. Suddenly, your wind power project that was competitive in Europe is absolutely not competitive in, in a developing country. And the only, uh, uh, only things that has changed is the cost of money. Now, do you have any idea why there is such a huge difference in cost of money between uh, a developed countries and a developing country? Risk. The level of uh, actual and perceived risk. The uh, financier basically price risk. When they have the impression that there is, for example, a sovereignty risk, that uh, uh, there could be an expropriation, or uh, when they have the impression that the technical skills of a country as such are not high enough to guarantee uh, a good operations, or that the wind survey was maybe not robust. Whenever they have the impression that there is a risk, they price it. And so when you want to promote green technologies, one of the key things to do is to reduce risk, reduce investment risk, improve the risk reward profile of green investment. Now, last year, I made a presentation to the uh, UN Wider Workshop on de-risking strategy. How do you de-risk green investment? And in a sense, you either treat the risk, for example, you simplify licensing processes to make sure that you can immediately get a sitting license for your wind farm. You can transfer risk through partial guarantees, or you can tax risk, negative tax subsidies or positive tax for fossil fuels. So I'm not to further discuss this issue of de-risking green energy investment. I will basically refer you to the presentation of last year. Today, I would like to focus on the second part of a green market transformation, which is to deepen national financial infrastructure. Even if you reduce dramatically your risk, if you have to rely on international capital markets for your asset financing, you will be limited. First, because international capital market tends to be extraordinarily conservative and volatile. So the, uh, the, the premium they will put even on your residual risk will be extremely high. The second reason is because green technologies are mostly local. 70% of the technologies are local technologies. And so it's extraordinarily important not only to de-risk the investment, but also to deepen the national financial architecture. Are you still with me? So let's discuss about what is a national financial architecture for green energy. The, uh, you have a number of different uh, institutions that can have access to different type of uh, financial resources. But in a sense, you're speaking about public agencies, national development banks, commercial banks, power utilities, special purpose funds, equity funds, etc., and leasing companies. And each of these institutions play a key role in terms of uh, revenue, in terms of accessing different type of money, budgetary allocation, extra budgetary, household finance, capital market, uh, operating surpluses, and in terms of products that they give. By and large, every single developed country today has all these different type of uh, financial institutions operating in the field of clean energy. And not only it's important to have each of these different type of institution, but the way they interact is also extraordinarily important. And I would like to take one example. I would like to compare uh, uh, Germany and France in terms of financing of decentralized renewable energy. They, these two countries have more or less the same GDP per capita. They have more or less the same cooperative traditions. They have more or less the same level of uh, awareness in terms of climate change. They have the same type of institutions exactly the same type of institutions. So you will expect the results to be more or less the same between the two countries. Now, cooperatives are playing an extraordinarily important role today in Germany in terms of financing decentralized renewable energy. 
PV, PV panels, uh, wind, uh, wind turbine, etc. Cooperative, basically 100, 200, 500 people come together, uh, pool their money as equity, and finance one big wind turbine, for example. In Germany, it's extraordinarily popular. It's a, we are seeing a huge boom. Today, we have close to 800 energy cooperatives, each of them with a capital of more than $2 million. So we are not speaking about a kind of anecdotal finance here. We are speaking about $1.6 billion. And in Germany, what's happened is that when people decide to create a cooperative, First, they are helped by a very attractive feeding tariff, a guaranteed price. In addition, the law, the law for the cooperative is extremely friendly for energy cooperative. You have a specific type of law that makes it easier for people to come together. The, it's very light in terms of regulatory requirement, etc. And so uh, you have an attractive feeding tariff, you have an easy uh, regulatory framework, and in addition, this cooperative can get some debt finance from, uh, from commercial banks, thanks to the fact that KFW, the National Development Bank, can provide some credit enhancement mechanism, guarantees, uh, jun uh, junior debts, low interest debts, etc. And in addition, local government can easily also provide some equity for cooperative. So you have a very, very dynamic financial uh, sector that is helping individual uh, initiatives. Now let's look at France. These two countries are very similar huh, in terms of uh, institutional infrastructure. But in France, you don't have 800 cooperatives. You have a handful of cooperatives, despite the fact that you have the same level of activism. And the differences are very minute, but are extraordinarily significant. One thing is that uh, the regulatory framework for uh, energy cooperative in France does not exist. There is not a special regulatory framework for energy cooperative. It's the traditional investment uh, community framework. And this, uh, this regulation were designed to uh, protect consumers from con jobs. They were designed to make sure that people will not be abused. So you have a lot of check and balances. And it's a hell of a job to try to simply set up a co an energy cooperative. So you do not have, despite the fact that you have, like in Germany, DENA, uh, a public agency for regulation in France is called ADEM, despite the fact that you have the same agency, you do not have the same regulatory framework. In addition, the, uh, in Germany, while KFW provides credit enhancement, the equivalent of uh, KFW in France called Caisse de, de, de Depot et de Consignation does not provide uh, credit enhancement. And therefore, the cooperative have to go straight to capital markets to try to get money or to commercial banks. And the com most, of com most commercial banks are not familiar, are not really enthusiastic about financing these energy cooperatives. And in addition, it's very difficult for uh, governments to provide equity for energy cooperative. I did not put a red cross here because actually they can provide, but in a modest quantity. So the result, you have the same institutions, you have the same configuration, but some very, very tiny differences. And the result is that in one country, 800 cooperative, in the other one, eight. 100 times less. Now let's take a developing country with a nascent financial architecture. You often, you've, you often end up in the situation where the National Development Bank is not capitalized and cannot provide credit enhancement. You often end up in the situation where the commercial banks, the national commercial banks, do not have access to international capital markets and they cannot tap in well-developed domestic capital markets. People who have savings end up investing in U.S. Uh, Treasury bonds, not in national uh, currency uh, bonds. And you often have public agencies which are undercapitalized, which are not able to uh, provide the type of uh, demonstration projects, the, the type of uh, project development support and the uh, policy uh, uh, support needed for a cooperative. And the local government often do not have the right to intervene as equity uh, financier and in, in, in addition do not have the money to do so. And so you end up in a situation where uh, 
you do not have the institution and often the institutions are not capitalized to do so and often they do not have uh, the, the partnership needed. And so there, it's next to impossible for a cooperative to see the light of the day. Now, a key issue in terms of uh, green uh, market transformations is what kind of uh, small step can we make in order to improve access to domestic uh, resources? Knowing that today, the, uh, the uh, most developing countries have huge savings, trillions of dollars of savings. So it's not the absence of money, it's the absence of proper investment vehicle for that money to contribute to national infrastructure development. And so my office is increasingly uh, being asked by, uh, by governments to uh, explore the, the potential of special purpose fund to try to connect different types of institutions and uh, come with uh, and, uh, and catalyze institutional innovations. Now, a special purpose fund is simple. Huh? It's uh, a, special, a special type of money for special objectives. And for example, KFW in Germany was established after the Second World War to uh, manage the Marshall Plan money for reconstruction. The Caisse de Dépôt et de Consignation in France was uh, established after the Battle of Waterloo to manage some specific type of savings for reconstruction. It seems that losing a war is good in terms of national <laughs> development agencies. So this kind of uh, special purpose fund, the basically are uh, immediate ban aid to do something very specific. And so one could perfectly imagine that one could use a national fund to uh, catalyze international public assistance, wherever it comes from, to help to provide grants to help in developing an enabling regulatory environment, to provide some uh, uh, grant to help in uh, establishing some uh, pilot demonstration projects, establishing a track record for banks to learn, to show that this technology can work. And after such a national fund could uh, increase is uh, capitalization, sources of capitalization, through, for example, developing extra budgetary allocation, innovative sources of finance. So you grow the amount of public money you have. And we could imagine that such a national fund will enter in cooperation with a national development bank to provide credit enhancement mechanism. Once you have your track record, once you have your projects on the ground, you start providing some credit enhancement uh, instruments to help commercial banks to basically uh, support the next generation. And one could imagine that such a national climate fund will basically flood bonds to tap the uh, national uh, uh, domestic markets uh, in the future with credit enhancement to guarantee the return for domestic investors. So you have an instrument that over a period of uh, four to six, seven years, could basically help you in getting some connection uh, uh, established. And these national funds could either be phased out, and this goes back to a budget, uh, budgetary allocation, or could be subsumed under a public agency, or could be subsumed under a national development bank, or like KFW and uh, CDC, become national development bank themselves. And so, one of the most interesting uh, area of uh, research in the field of uh, green market uh, transformation in the coming years will certainly to be, be to, to see how we can use some uh, special purpose fund to, uh, to, to foster institutional uh, innovations and uh, start connecting different type of uh, players. <laughs>